I think we're good to start. Okay, great. Cool. So thank you so much, uh, everybody, for uh, attending this uh, talk today. Um, I think everybody's mic, apart from those who are speaking, should be muted. So I guess I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Nohani Makhafi. Uh, online I go by Intivent and I'm a Yemeni artist, um, singer, songwriter and I recently graduated from SOAS University of London with a Masters in Migration, Mobility and Development and I'm also the founder of Al Yemeniya, uh, a platform dedicated to Yemeni women. Um, as I'm sure many of you are probably are aware, um, the last few years in Yemen have been very difficult and the main focus in public discourse has been the war, the disease outbreak, famine and now coronavirus. Um, today, however, we're talking about a different issue um, that has not gained much attention and that is the challenges behind cultural preservation. We will be covering two topics with our speakers today. Firstly, the looting of various museums and archaeological sites and the illegal trade of those items. Secondly, we'll be looking at cultural preservation from a different angle by discussing the depleting linguistic diversity in Yemen. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Arabic is not the only language spoken in Yemen. And today we have Professor Janet Watson and Saeed Al Mahri to talk to us about their research in this field. Our first speaker, however, is Dr. Amr al Azam, who will be talking to us about his work uncovering an illicit online trade in antiquities across the MENA region. Uh, Dr. Amr is an associate professor of Middle East history and anthropology. Oh, did I get something wrong? I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm a professor. Oh, you're a professor. Yes. I think I said that. Not doctor? I have, I'm a full professor. So should I go for doctor or professor? It Sorry. doesn't matter. It's all okay. the same. It's, but I, it's just I, so professor. I'm actually, I've been promoted two years ago. Years ago. Okay, so I'll go for, I'll go with professor. Sorry, my bad. Right. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So uh, Professor Ahmed is an associate professor of Middle East history and anthropology at Shawnee State University in Ohio. Uh, he reads archaeology of Western Asiatics at the University College London. He read, sorry. Uh, he's also a founder and board member on the Day After Project, TDA, and coordinates the Heritage Protection Initiative for Cultural Heritage Protection at the TDA. Uh, he also serves as co-director of the Athar Project. Um, just before I hand over to you, um, I'm just gonna let everybody know that if you do have any questions, just write them in the chat box and we will go over all, over the, go over all the questions at the end of the session. So um, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, Professor Amber. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, um, I'm going to do, do a screen share a minute, hopefully, and then this will work nicely. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you guys. Um, we don't, don't often get to engage with, with small student groups. We tend to often are often invited to the to these event uh, where I am, I am at least invited to bigger event events and there it's uh, a lot more impersonal and and uh, you know, completely different setup so um i re i really look to these kinds of small group uh, talks where you're actually you're actually in with students rather, rather than other heritage professional um who who you know have have their own sort of access to grind kind so this was a great opportunity and I really appreciated it. Anyway, anyway, um, I'm going to, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, I, and, and I put that at the outset, I'm not a Yemen expert, all right? I mean, I mean, we have colleagues in, in Yemen that we, we communicate with. Um, I'm obviously uh, uh, well aware of what happens in the MENA region. And when we look at the, look at the problems of and trafficking and so on and so forth, we don't just look at them from a single source. We look at them across the region and we also, Particularly, fo particularly focused conflict uh, areas, and Yemen, Yemen is one is one of the long long standing conflict areas uh, in in the region. So obviously, Yemen is on our is on our list. But I'm a Yemen expert, not in terms of its history, cultural, cultural archaeology, etc. And I do do apologize for that. Anyway, without much ado, do uh, I'm going to start this. So I'm going to do a, a screen here. I'm going to go for Sky Share. And then, then I'm going to do this. And hopefully it'll work. Got a slideshow? Yeah, yeah. 
seem to have a slideshow working here. Okay. All right. So I titled this talk uh, "Protecting Heritage: The Local Local Way" because I will find that the core of my um, um, conversation with you is going to be, be really about how, at the end of the day, they aid down to local local communities, local stakeholders. Uh, local active activists, local archaeologists who can be best be uh, positioned to try to protect uh, uh, country or any uh, society's uh, cult cultural heritage. You know, there are these international organizations ranging from UNESCO to ICOM to ICROM, etc. Et et and they have their role, they have, they have their place in, in offering assistance uh, uh, aid, support, um, technical, and so on and so forth. But really, but really, you come down to it, and then as we've seen in so many different areas, we've seen this in Syria, we've seen this in Iraq, we've seen this in in yeah, and in Yemen, Yemen uh, you know, to name but a, but a few major uh, zones where we have both conflict and uh, traffic trafficking, destruction, cultural heritage. It, it really comes down to the local. Uh, people and then they are real heroes of our story today. Hey, um, again, I, I like to like to start like this by, by just trying to explain why cultural heritage is important. I mean, in usually, and as I said initially when we started off, you know, you know, we're dealing with conflicts, we're dealing with it's Yemen or Syria or Iraq, Iraq. These are society communities that have that have experienced extremely traumatic um, circum circumstance in many case, cases they they they're no longer really countries as, as such um, they've been they've ruptured across every possible civil clear within their societies um, and and you are often kind of faced with this what I refer, what I refer to binary of well you can you you know in 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 certain sort of I think to address the the, the unfolding catastrophes in these in these in, in these places, where you either have to care about about trying to help people, They're doing basically basic human humanitarian uh, as, assistance, providing medicine, food, shelter, even even education, etc., and, and that becomes a primary focus. Or you care about cultural heritage and um, history. Museums, etc., and somehow the two are, two are not to to meet, meet. And I strongly re reject reject this. I do not believe that this that this binary should exist. Even though, often where I am asked that question, that question: How can you care about serious cultural heritage when you know, you know people are being cultured in their thousands? And I say, look, it, it's not. The two are are interlinked, interconnected. Because because they form part of the national identity, Iraqi, Syrian, Syrian, Yeni, uh, Libyan. It's part of your national identity. It's a shared shared history. Everybody knows the key uh, um, aspects of the history. Um, e e even opposing sides sides of the conflict, you could go back, go back up, and you know they will recognize a certain common. Element and it's often seen as important to all to all sides. More critically for us in, in this situation, I also believe to believe that cultural heritage can play a very important role with with post reconciliation and civilization. In part because uh, cultural heritage sites, monuments, museums, etc., can can um, become a safe space, a even a can can evolve to play a very critical role in providing that space where where Chinese or Syrian Syrian or Iraqis or or Libyan Libyans and one day come together together again, you know, in in a as the as the as the wars and conflicts die down, and then maybe try to talk about their experience in a space where where they still share something together. Um, and so, so I think these these sites, sites uh, locations, stations can be very important. And so protect, protecting and preserving Yemen's history and history and heritage is also about safeguarding its future too. Now, in terms of the kind of damage we often see to culture, cultural sites in con conflict areas, and this is not exclusive to Yemen, or Yemen, obviously, um, um, uh, you know, ongoing military, military operations 
are the ones the ones that usually get of attention you know where you see an airstrike strike on, on, on a building or a museum or a site and and i believe there are there are those well documented and ongoing conflict conflict um, and, and all sides i'm not going to sort of talk you know sorry dr Ahmed, i'm so sorry to cut you off there um but i just want to ask if it's possible it's indiscriminate. to but but mm -hmm. in doing in focusing on the military operations actions and the destruction caused caused by uh, military operations, we we the much more widespread spread in my opinion much much more damaging uh, type of damage we see with uh, um, act looting. This is uh, not from Yemen. This is from Syria. But this is a, this is a good example of uh, the kind of very destructive looting, looting going on in Syria. Syria. Um, in this case, case this case, this is uh, under the is, this was in an area an area under control of Daesh ISIS ISIS and they had licensed this person to to to, to loot this um, archaeological site and as you can see they're using um, um, a, a a bulldozer here to, to dig it out and and if you these this type of type of looting is you know doesn't produce you smart or or you just get let get little and pieces the, the, the looting. Um, you know, that occurs uh, um, actually quite um, lucrative. Lucrative is an example from that from that site in Syria that I showed you the, the bulldoze from, and you can see that a significant amount of material came came out site that was then, that was then sold. In this case, this stuff ended up in Raqqa um, and sold at auction by by ISIS and disappears. Disappears. And the only evidence we have we have is the so these photos that we were able to get. And of course, Yemen is not immune to loot, to looting there, and so you know, we see, uh, in, in this case, sites in Yemen also also be uh, looted in in a similar similar fashion. So um, often we and I, and I was uh, often we assume that the greatest form of damage, and that's the damage that gets that gets the most, the, is it is the damage from military action, and but really uh, the damage from looting is far more extensive, and. Uh, uh, Causes a, a lot more harm than uh, the military stuff. Even though the mil military action is the one that gets the most, the most attention, at least, at least in the media. Um, um, but then we also have another um, situation, and this is something that we start to start to see in 15, a darker, darker, more manifestation, and this time associated with ISIS, with Daesh, and their control, control, addition of cultural, cultural heritage. It's important to state, state right away here that. Dash, despite what you know, we read and have been told in, in 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 much of the media and elsewhere, where you know, Dash's attitude uh, to culture, cultural heritage is specifically one where it sees, sees it as a a resource to be exploited. Okay, and this is and this is important to, to bear in mind as in mind as I explain the next couple of slides slides down, and so. Um, we see in 2015 this new manifestation, manifestation which are, are essentially described, or I would describe them as cultural atrocities in, in, in places like Mosul and Nimrud, Hatra, Palma, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, this is not an example of iconoclasm as an extremist, extremist interpretation, some Quranic, Quranic um, you know, text or sunnah or whatever. This is, is straight out of out of the the, the playbook of, uh, of uh, you know of, uh, exploiting uh, uh, natural you in, in know this is an expo exploitation resource in 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 uh, you know when when uh, ISIS this that very pub very publicly set to destroy the content of a museum like that of Mosul or blowing up archaeological logical sites, monuments on arts on archaeological sites or or, 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 or uh, Myra what they're doing is using those sites sites use heritage as a propaganda in propaganda tool to, to uh, project their ability to act with impunity and the impotence of a national communities to respond to these uh, these acts and so this is this is a very powerful propaganda message. It was used very effectively by ISIS. ISIS certainly did not invent it. Invent it. We know that the Taliban used it back in 2001 when they blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas. And we know that that, for example, the release of the, of the video uh, 
showing the destruction of the contents of the Muslim game was timed to coincide with the anniversary of the destruction of the Bali and Buddha. So there's a lot of thought and, and care gone in, gone into these um, sort of cultural um, atrocities are basically orchestrated. And we, and we need as such and not, not as some sort of extremist, you know, iconoclastic, radical, crazy behavior because it, because it was not that. Um, so we all know, we, we, you know, we've all seen the images of the Temple of Ben and Palmyra and how it was destroyed. Void. But I, I also want to sort of help you distinguish with another type of destruction that um, um, also, per also perpetrated and none of culture. And this is, it is against religious sites. And in this particular case, this example here is, is that was advertised, advertised by uh, Daesh themselves. themselves. And this is a destruction of uh, the uh, shrine of and, and tomb of Eunice, you know, the Jonah, the, 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 the tomb of Jonah. And this is different, again, this is different from the destruction of the contents of the Museum of Mosul, which is basically, basically a propaganda for impotence and impunity and, ha you know, and uh, this case, that's, that does have a uh, dimension because Part of Daesh's ideology is the need to extirpate, extirpate and, and the elimination of any non-Islamic practices. And they, whilst, whilst they know, and they, when they, and, and it would be, you know, absurd uh, to suggest that anyone would would walk in a couple of bell and start and start worshiping, uh, you know, you know. Uh, ancient God, but people, you know, you know, Muslims and 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 others do go to these these places, shrines, whether they're Sufi, whether they're, they're uh, places of worship by Shi'a, by Shi um, you know, or whatever. Th those do have a religious dimension, and therefore their destruction is specific, specific part of an act of purification of Islam. Islam as far as concerned. And therefore we should again see that as a separate form of destruct destruct than the destruction of destruction of contents of um, and again that has nothing to do with iconoclasm and, and very very much to do with propaganda. Um, how do we protect against these kinds of activities? I started off my talk talk if we were cut off by saying that you know really it's it's local communities um, that are going to be the most active the most powerful form of form of change. So and and, and 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 so when I say that in, in conflict zone conflict areas like um, Yemen, like Syria, like like Iraq, like, 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 the greatest greatest burden has been uh, in these local in these conflict areas has been on local state actors, local stakeholders, non-state actor, actors, and those include uh, um, you know local councils, NGOs, etc. And these local non-actors often often uh, form their own net networks of local heritage professionals and society activists, and they, and they even will go for for very simple creative solu solutions to try to promote awareness, strengthen local community, uh, sense of ownership, and in in some cases have been known to mobilize against news and the trade and artifact. But most critically, and I think. Really, the saddest of this, of this, they often receive receive little or no support or recognition uh, from the larger, more international organisations like you, like UNEF, and so on, so on, so forth. The other thing that we need to talk about and bring into play here is the role and impact of, impact of social media. But, you know, in, in addition to the fact that you have these conflicts, you have, you have the looting, you have the the, 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 the the military activity that is that is active as well. well um, we then have, have this other element, which is social media. Now, it's important for us to understand that and that social media, media really took in the MENA region from the start of 2011 and the Arab Spring. Spring on. You can see, see literal growth is exp exponential from, you know, the tens of thousands to the mill millions by the end of, you know, you know 20 and coming into, into 2020. And so, you know, with the uh, presence and and with the wide the wide uh, abil ability of so people to access uh, social media, we have to take into account the on the impact uh, uh, this uh, uh, of these these platforms 
uh, and how they affect um, you know the traffic picking uh, and, and and destruction of, of antiquities because think of it this way uh, you know the same features that, that you use on a daily ba daily basis to um, communicate with our friends to talk to a uh, colleague to just just tell people what I had breakfast or something you did you know some you know, you post a, yeah, a selfie of yourself. So all, all these nice, these nice little tweaks that, that are there. So also, the deal toolkit for a would-be trafficker or looter. So the same means that I might, I might use. You know, I use my use my WhatsApp to you and chat to you and then give you an interview. A a a a, a would-be uh, uh, you know, you know or, or traffic trafficker will need to contact me to, to try and tell me, as you can see here in the image, a mosaic in Istanbul. Some cylinder cedar seals, and so so uh, from uh, 2014 onwards, we notice explosion of, of material being marketed, being offered on sale on Facebook, and so Katie Paul, Paul my colleague, colleague co-author of the Athar report, founder of the Athar project, and I started to doc document. Um, um, these, these uh, groups and, uh, and and images and activities, this illicit activity for trafficking of antiquities on, on uh, social media platforms and specifically on, on Facebook. And uh, when we published our report in last year, summer of 2019, we we uh, we had sort of sort of documented 95 active groups on Facebook. With some 488 admins, but more, but more, those groups can groups contain something like just under two million members. So you have two million people right in the Mena region, interacting, interacting with other, being being offered material to buy, to loot, information about how to loot, um, exchanging, changing uh, sets, all all of this happening in plain sight, in open view, on. Uh, uh, so essentially, essentially, Facebook ends up serving as, as this grand zero for online traffickers to connect, to advertise, to move to move deals, to, ex to exchange ideas, informa information, uh, and so on and so forth. And again, I, 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 I re this is not dark web. web. It's not, you know, you know, don't have special com computer skills to this. You just literally just go into Facebook right look right now. Type in 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 Arabic news, uh, you know, which is treasure in Arabic, um, um, or antiquity, antiquity, or, or anything like that, and and you will see how much material will be returning. And if you think it's just antiquities, you can do this for guns, you can do this for um, drugs, you can do this, do this for human trafficking. All of this stuff is happening right now in Facebook. And and only in plain. And by the way, all, all these activities um, are also banned by Facebook. So so guns, for example, has example has been banned, not allowed according to Facebook immunity uh, standards. And and as you are well aware, aware and also supposedly banned banned the sale of antiquities. All of this is still happening uh, and, and in unrestricted fashion. And, and of course, what we see that see then on Facebook are stories, videos, videos, photos, international connections, and then the algorithm itself itself you know helps you once you once you're in it starts to rec recommend people to you who it thinks are interested or might share the same the same. So not only does not only does it help to post your, your stuff there, it also finds potential uh, other potential buyers or people you might that might that might have something that you are interest, interested in or information and then connect you with it. So it even helps you with your networks. And finally, now, um, um, it also facilitates and takes payments as well. So it's a complete package. And uh, as a result, you have, have the tracking, you know, you, you know, you know, last year we had 95, now we're over, over 120 group tracking just in the MENA region. And many, many and, and these groups are, some of, some of them are, many of them actually are, actually are secret or closed, but some of them are, are completely open as well. And you might get a question as to how to get how to get it. You can see an example example of them here, and uh, you know that, that I've posted up here. And so, through through Facebook and other social media, social media platforms, you're essentially providing 
would be traffickers and looters access to a, to a global uh, market that require sell, sell, exchange goods and information from any part of the world that you choose. And these are example, examples. I'm going to show you this video here. I don't know if you can see it. This is, this is from you. Okay, this is somebody, but the in right, you know, you know um, basically 2018, trying to trying to sell this uh, bronze statue that they 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 had looted, looted, and you can see you can see it here. And you, and you can see the date giving you the date. It's uh, green, obviously, but. You can get the idea, idea. This and it's a statue. It's not, not, and it's not a small thing. And then this is another example. This is this is from here, and this, and this is a person to sell uh, a, a, a very beautiful uh, group of mosaics. And notice that he that he stuffed himself with the with the mosaics in an institute. That like, that helps authenticate the item. So, um, um, you know, so this guy is basically saying, okay, hey, here are. This is this is the mosaic, and he's using his own, own head, his own face as a scale, uh, you know. And we know we know these mosaics have seen basically ripped, ripped out, removed, and moved. And I think the last time I tracked it, they were somewhere in Beirut and shipped out, out to whoever is there. And then we have looked to order, where you have individuals, um, members, or, or, or group admins will advertise for, for a material they're specifically looking for, and then members will, will contact them and say, "Hey, I have something that." So in this in this in this first one, somebody's looking for Judaica, uh, you know, and in the other one, uh, uh, something for or you know, Islamic Islamic manuscripts. And then you have people, you know, communicate, communicating, advertising, and uh, often goods for sale, sale. And again, all of this uh, happens in this uh, tightly knit social, social work, all, all operating on, on Facebook. And you can see here in this uh, uh, particular case that Yemen, Yemen, this is an example of sample of some groups who are entering and uh, basically uh, the percentage uh, element, element see Yemen there with there with we have 56 people people um, some um, items Libya 57 Syria we had a lot more obviously but again again we were focused on Syria, Syria back then because of, of our research but you can see again that the the the, the items being often offered um, uh, from these countries uh, 36% are offered, are offered conflict nations, 20% other other con countries, and 44% uh, from uh, countries uh, conflict uh, conf nations. So the material being offered in the conflict as its own and spreads out to the bordering areas and then there gets trafficked further out, further out on. Um, uh, that's uh, all right. um, we did one major study, case study, looked at uh, four four group in, in Idlib and Idlib, and we, we analyze those group groups. Um, we analyzed um, their membership. We analyzed we analyzed where they were access access. We analyzed where the location is in Idlib, who their members are, who they connected to, who's their, their group founders and so on and so forth. And we we discovered discover there's this incredible network of connections that go beyond just Syria. This, this is from this one group and look and look connected to people in people in Yemen. They connect people in in in, 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 in Gulf. They connected to people right across North Africa. They connect they connect people uh, uh, in Europe and even in the United United States. And uh, and, and, the, and this is just and now we're doing we're doing we're doing some doing similar studies on other uh, uh, conflict uh, countries like Libya, Iraq and Yemen. These are some examples of items that I, I thought put out there for you, just you, just to show you uh, some of the items that are put on offer. These are from uh, looted from Yemen. This is actually from actually from in Yemen, unfortunately. Unfortunately, so basically help them themselves to this uh, carving from a museum. Um, this this one has actually actually a excavation or, or museum number, catalog number on, on it. Um, again, this is from from Yemen. Uh, this is a bronze head. head um offer again for sale uh and you can see here where is it found you can see the right the writing the guy says in is in yen 
is offering it for sale. And this is April 2018, team, right at the top, little top, little back for sale. Uh, um, again, more items for sale from Yemen. Uh, uh, we see points in coin collection, etc. cetera. So, so I want to sort of finish off by, by just saying a little bit about how, how can local communities protect, protect preserve, you know, what, what, what can people do? How do we stop this? It's so extensive now. It's so widespread. Facebook is because the monst monstrous report of, of photos and images and, and items being offered for sale. And, the, and it's important to remember, to remember these items, items, okay? The, the only time we know this existed, remember that this is not out of a museum. The only reason why we know this exists is because somebody, somebody posts Facebook. It's very, it's very important to remember that. The, the, this is the, First time we know that this item existed as, you know, not just as Yemenis, but as humanity, we know that this item existed because somebody post, posted Facebook, and then it, and then it, it's gone, um, and it and it disappears. So Facebook is now this massive repository. Of so how do we try to try to sort of piece of such over, overwhelming force? Or forces between looting and uh, destruction from military action, action and, and the the power of social media and it's, it's the way it has facilitated the 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 uh, the, 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 the movement sale and tra trafficking of, of these goods. Well, well, there are a number of ways. One 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 sort of technological logical element. This uh, material it's called saltwater. It's actually manufactured in England. It's a it's a company that makes it, and they they provide us provide us with they provided us with this this stuff for for our museum in Italy, and it's really quite an amazing. It's a remarkable substance. It's, it uses it uses an algae, and you can see uh, uh, our guy. He's got a little uh, uh, spray pump, and he sprays the object with it. And what it does is it is it when is it dries invisible, invisible, but side the the, the 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 residue dries on it. And then it's safe to use on inorganic objects. You can't use it on organic material. You can only you can only use it, uh, you know, on on stone or ceramics and stuff, stuff like that. What it does is when it dries, it is invisible. But if you were to you were to shine a a infrared um uh, sorry a, an infrared light on it, uh, sorry UV ultraviolet light on it, it up like a Christmas Christmas tree. And so so you if you this object were to show up. For example, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a store in London or London or in Paris or New York, and you had one of those little lights that you can sort of UV V light, and you see this, then then you, that this has been marked marked by someone back in the, the country of origin, and then therefore after that looted and brought to to Paris or wherever. Ever more clearly, if you were to take a, a sample of that that luminescent stuff. And send it to the lab. The lab in in, in England, England basically makes smart water. Water. It can tell you exactly the day, the time, and who was the person who marked that, and which country tree. So, if if you have the right custody, you can then now go to court and say that this item was was looted from uh, Idlib in this case, case on such and such such you know uh, you know because on such and such a day it was in such and such a place. And it was marked by so and so and so. We could have all these these. I think really this is something that that if the Yankees were to get hold of, we we were offered this stuff. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to the uh, smart water smart water have a foundation. They they were able to give us this stuff to, to use. Other ways uh, in, in that uh, communities can protect protect their cultural heritage is to obviously if they have any exposed uh, materials, they can move them out of the way. You know, and protect them. Them sanding is a very effective, very simple, low-tech way. It really does work. This is again Idlib, which which was by the uh, targeted, targeted with airstrike at least three times. Um, in this case, it was a Syrian regime and Russian airstrikes strike, on Idlib. Oh, are you are you there? Can you see me? See me? Yep, we can see you. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, we can see you. And we can. Uh, uh, can can you can you see? Yeah, okay. yeah, we can see you. So we good? good? Can I? Can I? All right. Um, All right. Just have so a. Hear this, uh, um, so you so please. Um, uh, the the effect effect of uh, sandbagging, bagging, the importance of sand sandbagging in protecting museums.
and also because in this case, as I said, this 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 museum targeted with air with airstrikes. Uh, in this, yeah, it was a Russian and uh, Syrian regime airstrikes, causing extensive damage. Damage and because of the sandbag, sandbag, all the mix in this in this in this museum were protected. Um, and the last thing that I, I also recommend that should be done where possible, possible in Yemen is a good example example for this, to try and st stabilize. You can't repair damage, damage once you have a conflict going on, but but you have to stabilize historic buildings and monuments in whatever way you can to preserve, preserve the after the conflict. You can go in and, and basically then have, you know, proper professional professionals to save, save and, and restore or repair those, those damaged uh, monuments. Okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you so much for that. The next speakers that we have today is Professor Janet Watson and Saeed Al Mahri, who will be talking to us about endangered languages in the region. Um, Professor Janet Watson studied Arabic and Islamic studies at the University of Exeter, linguistics at SOAS, and finally a PhD on the phonology and morphology of Yemeni Arabic dialects. Professor Watson took up the leadership chair for language at Leeds, at the University of Leeds, um, on the 1st of May, 2013. Um, again, before I go ahead to hand over, um, if you have any questions, please just uh, add them in the chat box and we'll go over all the questions at the end. So it's my pleasure to hand over to you, um, Professor Janet and Said. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just share our screen. And computer sound. Okay, so um, Asma asked me to talk about modern South Arabian, but this is a this is a workshop on Yemen. So we are going to talk about modern South Arabian. However, we couldn't really just talk about modern South Arabia without me mentioning some of my experience in North Yemen. So we're going to start off with that. Then we'll look at the language varieties in Southern Arabia, including modern South Arabian. Then we look at endangerment features, what it is that's endangering the language and culture of this region. The other thing you asked me about was language documentation and revitalization. So what measures are being taken? We'll talk about that for a little while. And then Saeed is going to talk about Mehri social structure and the threats and efforts to combat extremism. So Yemen, I went to Yemen first in November 1985, and I traveled quite a lot, but I had always felt in my heart I wanted to travel back into the past. And it was being in Yemen, in the rural areas, that made me feel that I'd reached my goal, that I was traveling back into the past. In terms of the linguistic variation, there's a huge variation, degree of variation in Yemen, in the north in particular. I mainly studied in the, in the western Yemeni mountains. And there are distinctions in terms of Lexus. Bainstedt in 1997 said that in terms of terms for the parts of the body, the correspondence between Yemeni dialects and northern Arabic was between 30 and 60%. And if we compare that with the correspondence of 40% between German and English, which are clearly different languages, you realize that you can't really be talking about, you can't distinguish dialects purely on the basis of linguistic features. And if we are going to talk about linguistic features, are these dialects of Arabic or what are they? Lack of mutual comprehension between dialect groups. So people from the Tahama may not understand people from the Western mountains. 
and you would move from one little village to another little village in the Western Mountains, and they would have shibboleths. They would say, from that, people from that village will say thuk, and we will say thuk. Slight minutiae in terms of pronunciation sometimes, in terms of intonation. But it told people this person was from that village and not from this. In terms of the morphology, there's considerable variation in morphology. The wonderful K dialects were the dialects that took me to Yemen in the first place, where you would say rather than Kitabd, for I wrote Kutbuk, Al Kutubk, with a final K. Intonation. Intonation differs, and very little work has been done on intonation throughout Yemen. We're going to lose this. It's just really, it's really sad. And then pausal features, which I loved, I fell in love with. Pausal glottalization, which you get really strongly in, in Sana'a. Pausal nasalization. So when my lovely friend from Ib, Dahsan Kabir Tifal Alam, when she contacts me or sends me a, a, a voice message by WhatsApp and says, Yeruhing, Yeruhing, with that final nasalization, it takes me straight back to Ib. And I remember the excitement of newness driving through wadis and then up the tortuous spiraling tracks to villages perched on hilltops, built of local rock so much so that you had to look twice. Was this a house? Was this a building or was it just a rock at the top of the mountain? And when we, when we later talk about threats to the varieties of modern South Arabian, these same threats and more are happening to these, to these lovely, lovely, wonderful, wonderful dialects, wonderful culture. And how colourful everything is, how colourful the language and cultural variety. From the dresses, the different dresses from different parts of the Western, the Western mountain range, the velvet dresses, Dresses seamed with silver, the loose transparent overdress of the Tahama, the tail dresses of the Mahra, and the large and tiny woven hats of the Tahama. In 1960, 90% of Yemen was rural. Today it's 63%. And this is something that we're going to we will look at when we look at threats to threats to modern South Arabian urbanization, the effect of urbanization. Um, this is Jibla. Right, so we now go on to language varieties of Southern Arabia. When we look at these, the classification, I've taken the classification from UNE the UNESCO Atlas of the World's Ap Languages in Danger. What we've done in the past is we've given estimates for the number of speakers for each of these languages. We no longer do that because it's absolutely impossible to know how many speakers you have for each language. Perhaps we can just about say for Bukhari, between 12 and 15. According, according to, to Miranda Morris, it will, it will be about that. But when you, have, when you have languages like Mehri, which have spoken across three state borders, it's already really difficult to work out how many speakers there are. And the other thing is, as we will show, not everyone who belongs to the Mehri, to, to the Mehri tribe speaks Mehri. So it's practically impossible without a, a full-blown survey to find out how many speakers we have. Um, so, um, yeah, these are, the, these are five of the six modern South Arabian languages. What I haven't put in is Habsusi because it's, it's Hadzus is spoken in the centre of Oman um, and uh, really doesn't come into, on the edge of, of, of Yemen at all. And I've added big Kathir because it's such an unusual dialect of Arabic. What's a dialect? Yeah, it's a big question. So in Yemen we have Mahri Hubyut, which straddles the border between Yemen and, uh, and Oman and Socotri on the, the island of Socotra and surrounding islands. Then we have these Yemeni Arabic dialects and then Razhit, uh, a language variety spoken in Jabaraza 
Um, and I and co-authors have raised the question of whether red heat is actually Arabic or was it, is it something else? Difficult to say. So, can you see my arrow? Yeah, because this map should come right up into here, into Saudi Arabia. This shows the position of Mehri, Shaharat, Ubiut, Bakhtari, Harsusi, and Sokotri. And you can see that Mehri covers a wider area. These languages are extremely rich, both linguistically and culturally. But also, I think, certainly the North Yemeni Arabic dialects, if we're going to call them Arabic, are extremely rich too. And they show a lot of features that we find in, in modern South Arabia, in terms of richness. We think that this language family may be the oldest extant Semitic language family. There are two reasons that, that uh, me and colleagues have forwarded this. One is the fact that it maintains three plain sibilants, sir, sir, and sir, one of which is lateral, sir. So you have sir, they, she, and she. Yeah? And we know that Sabaic and ancient South Arabian had three plain sibilants. We don't know how the third was pronounced because we don't have any recordings from them. Um, but it could well have been this. There's other, there are, there's other evidence that it could have been a lateral. And then we have dual pronouns. And it's the only, modern South Arabian, the only extant language family within Semitic that has dual pronouns. I know that modern standard Arabic, classical Arabic has dual pronouns, but no vernacular, no vernacular has dual pronouns. The other thing about uh, modern South Arabian is it has a dual pronoun for me and one other. And the only other Semitic language that has that is the long dead Ugaritic. Okay. So we have the pronouns, okay, okay, hey. We have terms for both. So kuluhki, kaleitki, kuluhi. And we have the pronoun suffixes on the verb. Pro, oh, yeah, pronoun suffixes on, on the verb. So sierk, sierki, uh, siro, sirito. And in the future, participle. And for, time, for sake of time, I'm not going to play this um, little recording. But I'm comparing here the number of consonants that you get in the consonant inventories of Shaharat and Mehri compared to Arabic. And if we're going to talk about Arabic vernaculars, then most of Arabic vernaculars don't have both bars and, and bars, so we can lift it up a bit more. Um, patrilineality and matronymics, the term seal, Lineage is extremely important among, in particular, among the Mahara, as it is, I believe, among the Bedouin in general. But all, all young boys learn their, learn their lineage. What I find more extraordinary is certain, certain men, and particularly quite a few young men I know, who know not only their lineage and the lineage of their direct family, but they also know the lineage of several other people from different families. And I find that absolutely extraordinary. And, for the sake of running slightly over time, I'm going to just play this through. Uh, Said, Berehmet, Berubhait, Berselem, Bershei, Baramer, Berselem, Bersai, Barale, Bertime, Bershagu, Baram Regi, Bersamode, Berbuki, Berehmet, Bergisus, Berserehi, Bereshai. So the lineage is patrilineal, but, and this is interesting, the men are known by a matronymic. So they're, they're given name, their son, plus some mother's name. Women are known by a patronymic. So I'm Janet, but Peter, Peter was my father. And Sa'it would be Sa'it, but and this I find, found really interesting, having worked in North Yemen, 
because in North Yemen, in, in many places, you're not supposed to mention the name of a woman. But here, women were being, women's were being celebrated. And in some cases, women's names are given in people's passport. So although lineage is patrilineal, there are some of my friends who, um, who have the name of a female ancestor in their passport. Whoops, sorry. So, what are language culture endangerment factors? They're all un unwritten language varieties. We talk about the Yemeni Arabic dialects. I don't, I really don't like that word anymore. If you've got something that's unwritten, it's really difficult to preserve it. We do have digital means of preservation. We can produce archives and that is one of the things that people are doing. But I really do think that writing is, is a, of vital importance. We've got the unwritten language writing, a literary high prestige national language, Arabic. Urbanization, I think urbanization is crucial. Um, and I often say this, but without giving figures, but this time I decided I would give figures. So we've already seen that Yemen was 90% rural in 1960. It's still 63% rural, but the population is much larger, which means that the towns have far more people. Amman was 84% rural in 1960, and it's 50, it was said to be, according to this website, 15% rural in 2018. That is a huge jump. That is absolutely massive. And what happens when people move from a traditional rural environment to the towns is that they lose contact with those aspects of the culture, those aspects of traditional culture, which were so crucial to their life and crucial to their lexis and crucial to their language. And then you've got monolingual education in standard Arabic, globalization. I think this is really, this is another crucial thing. The first time I saw imported fruit in Sanha, I wanted to cry. You can get what you, you can get everything you need from, from Yemen. You don't need to import apples from China, plastic cans. Islamic fundamentalism, uh, Saeed will talk about that later, and then all this population movement, immigration, emigration, tourism. It all affects language and culture. And of course, communication. The media, roads, airport, technology, television. People in the past would sit, sit by a fire and chat and tell stories. But now the television's very often on. One house I stayed in 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 Al in Al Mahra a few years ago. You knew when people were up because the television went on, and you knew when everyone had gone to bed because the television went on. It's not like that. It's not like that everywhere. In the internet, and of course, war, and that's for Yemen. That is the worst thing now. Um, yeah. So re on revitalization, revitalization methods um, within the uh, documentation and ethno linguistic analysis of modern South Arabian that I was involved with from 2013 to 2016, but we're still doing stuff on it with Miranda Morris. Saeed Al Mahri and others. We've been involving native speakers in documentation and dissemination as far as possible. So, since 2014, the vast majority of the talks that I've given, I've given in collaboration with someone like Saeed or other people from the from the community. We've got language archives at Ela, Salas over 200 hours of audio material and over 20 hours now of audio visual material. And you can visit these archives. They're under the different names of the languages. Uh, since 23rd March, I've been running online workshop with academics, professionals and community members on language and or nature in Southern Arabia and try as much as possible to get at least one person to one person from the community, one or two people to, uh, to present. 
And then, of course, you've got the role of YouTube and digital media, uh, which people are using, uh, which pe people in the community are using and, and know their way around far better than I would ever do, and WhatsApp groups. Uh, we've been developing a children's literature around nature, and I've got a really nasty feeling I won't have time to show you the uh, um, story of Salem and his shadow, but never mind. And um, Benjamin, I can't remember your second name, but just popped into the chat this link to Socotra Cultural Heritage, a program which was funded initially by the British Council, which is looking at tangible and intangible culture. And I think this is great. It really recognises that you can't separate nature from culture. And thank you to all the speakers. I think we're going to go ahead and do questions now. So um, I'll just uh, start I off by reading. Sorry? I, can't uh, I, I just said that we are going to do. We're going to do questions now. So I'm just going to read off questions from some of the audience. Uh -huh. um, and we will. Yeah, they will be directed to you and to Professor Janet and um, to Shad. No, not Shadi. Gosh, sorry. Uh, so the first question that we have is um, directed at Professor Janet, um, and it is asking about. So some 40 years ago, women in Sana'a often used a special dialect or vocabulary among themselves. Does this practice remain common today or are women and men now speaking all the time in standard Arabic? You're not speaking in standard Arabic, but it is. It, it were, the last time I was in Sana'a was 2008, but I don't think the language is going to have changed that much. It's funny, this is something that I heard quite a lot when I was in, in Yemen that um, that women and men spoke different, uh, basically different languages. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's true. There are aspects of women's speech which don't sound like, uh, like as, uh, they don't sound like men's speech. So for example, you get much more causal glottalization in front of her among women than you do among men. Mm -hmm. um, there is more use of diminutives, including diminutive verbs among women than there is among men. Mm. But I don't think that it's the case that women speak a different language than the men. Um, in the case of Rezhit, um, that, that was interesting in that the women would only speak Rezhit, but the men would be bilingual. They would speak Rezhit in Jaburazi and they would speak Yemenit, which mm -hmm. was used as a, a trade language. Um, and I think perhaps perhaps in that case you could say that the men had two registers and the women just had one register. Okay. But but no, they don't speak standard Arabic. No one speaks standard Arabic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for your answer. Um I have another question directed at you actually. Um and it is with Mehri, Shehret, Bathari, Hobiot, and Sokotri all have been spoken about three thousand years ago. I don't know. I don't know whether I don't know whether anyone knows, because if history is written, we've got no history of the languages being written. Mm -hmm. um, okay, fair enough. Uh, there's just one more question, and it's: um, Does it mean that the Omani side languages are more endangered as urbanisation has increased considerably since 1960? That was that's quite an interesting point, given when I saw those figures. Um, I think that that could well be the case. What's interesting though about the about Mehri, Mehri in, in Yemen is that it's very difficult to find someone in Yemen who can count, who would regularly count above 10 in Mehri, mm -hmm. whereas in the far you get it, you get that all the time. So people quite happily count on to 100 in the far. Mm -hmm. But in Yemen, you, they'll count up to 10. In, in Mahdi, and then they will go into, into Arabic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question for Professor Ahmed actually as well. Um, and the question is, uh, where do these looted items generally end up? Um, like, can they be tracked or is that sort right. of- Right, so that, that's, the, that's the million dollar question. And, and again, again, remember, Katie and I are not law enforcement agencies, and 
actually we have daytime jobs <laughs> so we we uh, we, we, you know, we, we uh, this is something that we do in our spare time. We do in the evenings and late at night and early morning, in the morning, whatever. Um, so often we don't know where they end up because we, we don't have ability to track. Once they go into the pri private, but, but um, you know that this, this stuff can take a long time to finally reach the international markets. We know it, go, it, goes, it goes straight to, to, you know, factors or private, you know, private individuals, but some of that stuff will eventually, eventually bleed into the, into the, into the open, uh, uh, maybe sometimes 10 to 15 years after the, the event ends themselves. And this is the pattern that, that they follow. The big markets are obviously London, Paris, New York, etc. Um, so that's where I would expect, expect this stuff. And I know that, I know there've been some, uh, some, some, uh, Efforts, you know, I've, I've, we've seen some stuff in Spain, in, in um, you know, there's stuff in Swiss, Switzerland. I know in, here in the U.S. we've had a couple of big cases. And, well, I, I can't really talk, can't really talk much about that because, you know, we're required to sign paperwork. The city can't talk about it. But but you know, we 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 do um, um, we do we do try. But by and large, it's it's very very hard to to sort of track this stuff once it. Once it goes off, goes off. Our main focus, in focus is, I mean, tra trafficking and, and, and dealing with trafficking and looting of antiquities. Think of it as a bridge, bridge. Okay, and you have you have a supply and demand end, end. and and uh, when, when you want to tackle something like that, you have, you have to tackle any military strategy, strategy to take a bridge, bridge and military. You have to take it from both ends, and so this is the same thing. Most of my work focuses on is on. The, uh, supply end, run demand end, and just because of you know where we have access and kind of stuff we're able to do to do, but uh, beyond the, beyond that, it gets a little a little tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have. I see some. I see. I see some options here. Yeah, there's right. another question for you actually, um, and it's oh yeah here we have. Uh, uh, Shamsa Al Masabi who's asking. I work in a acquisitions. I work in acquisitions in a museum in MENA, and I was wondering, is there anything we can do in museums to support the museums affected by war in the MENA? And also, is it possible to join the Arthur project as an individual? I mean, you are more than welcome to join. Uh, you know, you know, it, uh, we, we do open source research, basically, and uh, feel free, you know, our emails are, are available. Are avail Definitely reach out, reach out, and I'd be happy to talk to you about, about you know, how we can sort of uh, cooperate. We do, we do cooperate with a lot of a lot of different indi individuals and institutions, both on a, a individual level and on institutional level as well. Um, you know, and 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 I think the answer, the simplest answer to this question is as as, as mediums, as professionals in the sort of art market or you know object sort of acquisition market market um do due diligence you know at the end of the day i i don't care what you think think or what people say say look this looted whether it was loose looted you know yesterday or was whether it was looted a hundred years ago or a thousand thousand years it's still looted looted now we have a uh, national and international conventions that have determined that, that you know before 19 you know, you know the the, the uh, the 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 Hague Convention of you know the 1950s or four so so just you do due diligence to make sure at least that you are not dealing with dealing with material that's recently looted recently looted out, looted out of a conflict zone and and I think that would that would be major step in the right direction if we can start do, like doing that have the art market basically and be careful pay attention attention to due diligence since and um, stuff really has to do with, with legislation, you know, legisl uh, legisl legislation on a governmental level. Um, um, you know, one other thing, I think I know somebody mentioning about Facebook, you know, uh, basically tracking the stuff or taking it off. And it's very important, important to note here. Facebook is criminally negligent. They are criminally negligent. They know that this stuff is done on their platform. They, they've been taught it for year, years, we've warned, others have warned them. So, and don't think we're the only people out that there is. Plenty of people, people have, and they know, they know this is a problem and they won't do anything, anything about it. 
And even now, after a lot of pressure, and after a number, and I don't know, I don't know if CBC have done a couple of couple of uh, pieces on us and us and our work. And even after all of the publicity about all the stuff happening, and, and then they and they file themselves together together and move to ban the, the sale and you know handling and dealing of of, 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 of antiquities and cultural heritage heritage material on their plat platform, supposedly by changing their, their community standards, and then. Even so, and this came out back back in May or June or June, to this day, day nothing has changed. Nothing. And they they don't plant it, plant it, they don't care, care, and they think think they're of the law. And it's really, really unfortunate. Thank you very much. We have uh, another question, which is uh, do the panel do the panel agree that responsible heritage tourism can in fact contribute to the preservation and even promotion of endangered intangible cultural heritage as it helps to demonstrate the enduring value of this heritage no yeah um, yes I've just seen that um, um, yeah I believe that responsible sustainable tourism can contribute to the preservation and promotion of engaged, endangered tangible and intangible cultural heritage um yeah so it's a question of how to do that hmm. uh, i think we have another question sorry it's just i'm trying to get through them um Oh, do we ever see a political dimension to use of these languages, um, especially Mahri, in a similar sort of way as the Houthis make occasional use of ancient languages such as Himyaritic, e.g. in the Zawamil? Yeah, um, well, I think, I think language, language and politics can't be separated either, and it is a political decision which if you're multilingual, bilingual, which language you use in a particular situation. And um, Said Al, Al Mehdi, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much to the uh, Cambridge Society for organizing this event. Can I spare, say very, very briefly, I know there's mm -hmm. questions coming in. Now, guys, if you have, have any further question, questions that you want to ask me, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. You can either email mail them to me, or write my personal email email them right right now. Um, you can. We can add your emails on uh, the Cambridge Society Instagram as well. Maybe I mean I'm not part of the society, but maybe I'll do it. That sounds like a great idea. And I think we, we could share your email, uh, Dr. Amr, and also your email, Dr. Jana Anu, as well. It was also on your presentation for anyone who wants to. Um, I, I think Dr. Amr as well put it on the on the chat uh, for any further yeah. questions. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Noha, for being such a wonderful uh, moderator and for uh, facilitating the talk for us, um, despite all the various challenges we had from the audio. Uh, thank you so much to all the participants who managed to make it today, and we hope to see you um, in the next um, event we host. Thank you so much. Ma'asalama. Ma'asalama. everyone.